law the first law the first spiritual law of wealth and abundance write it down is called the law of absolute surrender the first spiritual law that governs wealth and abundance is called the law of absolute surrender the law of absolute surrender The law of absolute surrender. Job chapter 22, please. We'll start from verse 21. Job chapter 22. It says, acquaint now thyself with him, not with it, not with them, not businesses, and be at peace. Thereby, good shall come to you. Next verse. It says, receive, I pray thee, the law from his mouth. And lay up his words in your heart. He's teaching you how to prosper. And he's not mentioning any business. He's talking about the state of your heart. Down to 26. We're reading 26, 23 now. He says, if thou shalt return to the Almighty. Ah, to prosper. I thought you didn't need God. Job is teaching us a principle here. If thou shalt return to the Almighty, thou shalt be built up. And thou shalt put away iniquity far from thy tabernacle. 24. Then thou shalt lay up gold as dust. And the gold of offer as the stones of the brooks. Yea, the Almighty shall be thy defense. Because when you prosper, you will have enemies. And thou shalt have plenty of silver. For then shalt thou have thy delight. What? In your wealth? Your delight will be in who? the almighty and shall lift up thy face unto God that means even with the abundance your face will still be stayed on him Proverbs chapter 23 and verse 26 the law of absolute surrender my son I don't need your tithe yet I don't need your offering yet I don't need any of those things from you don't remove your shoe and drop anything here the first thing and the ultimate thing I need is not your business idea. Leave your brain, leave everything. What I need is your heart. My son, I don't trust you if your heart is still in your possession. Give me your heart. I know what money can do to you. You know, a lot of people say I'm humble based on what parameter? Who would have known that a little shepherd boy one day will kill somebody? Can I be very honest with you? Until God vets the state of your heart and concludes, don't trust whatever you think your heart tells you. The Bible says the heart is deceptive above all things and desperately wicked. Who would have known that a young boy would ignore his mother who gave birth to him one day simply because he has now become rich? Who would have believed that a young boy one day can stand and actually go and kill a human being and turn him upside down and drain the blood into a pot because he wants to make money. Can I tell you, the heart of man is dangerous. Until God vets you, you are not ready to do business with him. Very honest truth. The law of absolute surrender. In 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 5, speaking about the Macedonian church, it is true that Paul blessed them and all of that, but listen, it says, And this they did, not as we hoped, but they first gave of their own selves to the Lord. Can you see that there? The first thing they gave was their selves to the Lord and then unto us by the will of God before their substance. I submit to you by the authority of scripture that there are many people who are merely doing flesh-driven transactions in church. Most of our givings are not potent because they come from a heart that is not surrendered to him. Just because you are dancing with offering, it doesn't matter whether it's offering, whether it's a goat, whether it's a bag of, it doesn't matter in what fashion it comes. 
If God does not have your heart, believe me, you are not ready to prosper God's way. The law of absolute surrender. I'm yours, I'm yours. I'm yours forever. I'm yours, I'm yours. I'm yours. My life is yours. It's yours. It's yours forever. It's yours. It's yours. It's yours. Whatever you ask of me, whatever you ask of me, I surrender. I have prayed many times and even as I'm on this stage now, as, as a man of God, I am praying it. That if there is anything God gives me that I cannot give him back, my prayer request is that may it never come to me. Don't say amen for me. I'm praying to God. You pray your own prayer and, and, and tell God and say, Lord, if you are going to give me a car, a house, an estate, an oil well, doesn't matter what it is. If it would take your heart away from God, take away your sanity and make you too arrogant. Anything that makes your knees too far from the ground is dangerous for you. If you started the journey with him on your knees, even after 10 years as a billionaire, let him find you on your knees. Whatever you ask. This is the part that is not taught in church. This is the part that is not taught in business seminars. Christian people stand, I don't mean to be sarcastic, but people just begin to teach about money and they just fuel the lust of people. You see a lot of people diving on cars, because they want to claim it. Lie down on a car that you should be arrested. You lie down on somebody's car, telling lies. All this fake living is because people are not surrendered. People still borrow money, give narratives that are not there. I'm showing you the kingdom's way. With the dignity of kingdom integrity, you can give him everything everything that estate belongs to you that oil well belongs to you that company belongs to you and mean it from your heart can i tell you one thing i know about god anytime you tell god i give you anything get ready he must test you this, there are things you tell god you say okay i understand but there are other things he says i'm coming what did you say is my own mention them if you say isaac is my own i'm coming just because I left you in chapter 12 and the rest, I'm coming. When we get to chapter 22, I will tell you, take now thy son. Don't tell me he's the only one I know. Take him to a mountain and offer him as a bond offering. The Bible says Abraham got up early in the morning. This was his future. Can I tell you, you can drop a billion naira and yet not be surrendered. So I'm not even talking of money. I'm talking of a state where... If everything leaves you and Jesus still remains, you still believe that you are valuable. Absolute surrender. If we do not teach this in church, I am telling you we are going to produce a crop of millionaires that will shock the kingdom negatively. Most of the people we think are humble are not humble. They are humbled, not humble. Why do you stand and talk foolishly when you don't have anything to defend what you are saying? So you keep quiet and look wise. But in the presence of economic empowerment, that's when you see the revelation of... There are people today, if they make as little as 10 million or 5 million or 1 million, they will not listen to anybody again, including a man of God. Everybody lift your hands and say, lift your hands for what? Um, I dropped. You, you see that kind of thing? There are many families where you can easily know when money has come and when money has gone by the passion that is suddenly developed for devotions and prayer and all of this. You can know that there is trouble. There's one money that is hanging somewhere and everybody now, a fast is declared. People start praying. When that money arrives, nobody even knows it has arrived. Everybody just ignores God. No. 
what God is teaching us tonight is very powerful. And I, 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 I plead with the body of Christ, let us once again respect the place of surrender. More than tithing. You can bring tithe like a bribe from a carnal standpoint that just seeks to use God as a ladder and climb. You have wasted your money. That thing is donation. Can I tell you, the tray that carries your tithe is the purity of your heart. Not the, what you are dropping here. There are people who become wealthy people. You see, this is why I have profound respect for people who are wealthy in the kingdom and love Jesus Christ. Their heart and their, my regard and my respect for them has no bounds. There are people who will even go to Jesus like colleagues putting their hands in their pocket and say, I'm rich now. Come, talk to me. I need help. Answer me fast. I'm used to boys and orderlies around my life. Come and answer me. And Jesus says, this was not how you were. So what? I'm now blessed. Make up your mind and train everybody you know, yourself inclusive, to never be ashamed. Never be ashamed of surrendering everything to him. It's true. When your heart belongs to him, he can now trust you with anything and not be afraid. I was telling the school of ministry students that God is still looking for treasurers. His last official treasurer disappointed him. He's still looking for people to manage his money for him. It's easy for us to insult Judas and criticize Judas. But can I tell you the truth? Anybody who can trust you with money truly truly you were a trustworthy person at least at the moment out of all the 12 disciples it was only judas don't just criticize judas study him it's not easy to hold that kind of money and still be your uh, don't people steal money in church don't people steal money in offering basket don't people steal money in weddings where they, they write blank check and people pocket it and god is watching can i tell you having access to tremendous financial resources and still having your mind sane is profound stability. Profound stability. Next time you see a wealthy man who you know is wealthy by God and still has his mind, his sense of decorum, respect, discipline, sanity, don't just pray for that person. That person deserves your honor. Because I can tell you, this money thing has its own power. For Jesus to say you can choose only two options, either serve God or serve money. He didn't say serve Satan. Many people have disappointed God with this finance thing. God wants you to be exempted from that. There are many of us God has trusted with certain levels of things. You were loving God and worshipping him. You were a worker in church. The moment you became wealthy, This was the foolishness of Solomon. He got to a point where he forgot the God of his father. When he now increased and he had many. Look at his confession in Ecclesiastes. He said, everything my eyes saw that I want, I got. What sort of a man is that? And he said, here is a conclusion of reading many books, there is no end. And much study is only a weariness to the soul. This is the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep his commands, for this is the whole duty of man. Vanity upon vanity, he said. All is vanity. Are we together now? This spiritual law, absolute surrender. You can put your checkbook on the ground. Put your ATM cards on the ground. Put all the papers of your assets on the ground. And lie down above them. And say, Father, you are exalted above it too. Above it too. And the devil says, don't fall your hand. Don't forget that you are such a great man. And you say, no, I'm great because I'm able to lie down and worship. What was Satan looking for? Not money. He said, can you bow down and worship me? And I will give you this. If you can find my message, please go on our YouTube page, Koinonia Global. Follow my message, even as thy soul prospereth. 
I love him with my heart. And I continue to pray that he will grant me grace. That all these little, little increases that we're experiencing here and there, that God will grant us grace to still love him and remain and love him passionately. That the first thing that we communicate to our world is not our skill, our gift, our prowess, but our heart for God. I cast my crown before the highest royalty. I am undone before your glorious majesty. You're the King of kings and Lord of lords. You are the King of kings. You are the Lord of lords. Your royal majesty. Yabone nakao Sujata ne nakao Sarkin Salama The Prince of Peace Can you still cast your crown when you become an elder? It was not the young men that casted their crowns the Bible says the 20 and 4 elders. Whatever made them an elder, we know that an elder is one who has cheated time. An elder is one who has put wisdom in time. Added experience in time. Added a legacy in time. tell you i have still not found a reason to stop tithing i have examined the thoughts across boards leviticus chapter 27 and verse 30 the reason why people argue about tithe is number one because they think tithe is about money tithe is not about money and all the tithe of the land whether of the seed of the land or of the fruit of the tree is the lord's it is holy unto the lord this has nothing to do with a dispensation this is an ordinance let me submit to you. There are two reasons why I think the tithe issue has become a controversy in the body of Christ. Number one, and is because of the way we men of God drum it. We drum it because we need the money and because there have been a, a lot of misuse and extravagance with God's money. People have played all kinds of games with God's money at the expense of people's sacrifices and not everybody in church uh, people, God's people are not dummies. When they watch and they see that the value you are, pro you are producing does not match the kind of affluence and extravagance you are communicating, someone will be sensitive enough to ask questions. And because a tithe is a tenth portion, there is nothing to hide about tithe. Tithe, financially speaking, is a tenth portion of what you bring. And let me tell you, if that is combined from faithful people, it is a lot. Bankers, am I right? It is a lot. What is there to hide? Tithe was supposed to be a mechanism. Listen to me. According to scripture, the tithe was supposed to be a mechanism to cater for priesthood and to cater for the building of the Lord's house. To cater for priesthood. 
Remember, there was a time when the children of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, are we Bible students, that while they were boiling the meat, they were given the privilege of using a fork to pick without looking. The scene there became when they now started opening the whole pot and they would look for the choice part of the meat and use it. And God said, no, this is not. I gave you the privilege to at least pick something. Now, there are all kinds of policies and principles. I'm not going into the legalities of ministries and Christian organizations and all of that. But I can tell you it is because of the annoyance of people from the carelessness, the recklessness, and the misuse of God's money. This is what has led people into this anger that has evolved into this campaign. There are a few people who have intelligently studied and based on their conclusion, they feel this is not needed. But I tell you, the root of most of this tight problem has come because of an, a, a level of integrity that has not been effectively communicated. Are we together? But I submit to you, and as far as it is within the jurisdiction of this spiritual family, I can tell you, be a faithful tither. Tithe is a tenth portion according to scripture one tenth now i know that a lot of people have taught to bring 50 percent of your tithe 80 percent of your tithe the bible does not say that if god tells you personally it is a personalized dealing don't create a doctrine out of it and punish people within the boundary of contentment and vision 10 percent of what god's people bring should be sufficient to run the activities of the ministry within the boundary of contentment, vision, and integrity. Are we learning? Yes, sir. So let me encourage you, based on the truth of Scripture I have learned, based on the experience of veterans who have, been, who have truly prospered by God, I can tell you, do not stop tithing. If you don't have the revelation, settle down and get the revelation. Don't do it religiously. But as far as this house is concerned, as a ministry, we're a tithing ministry. As an individual, I'm a tithing person. And I can tell you, tithe is not about money. It is called the law of open heavens. According to Malachi chapter 3, when you begin to read from verse 8, it says, will a man rob God? It says, but ye say, wherein have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings. So the Bible is talking about robbery here. It says, ye are cursed with a curse. This is not the curse of the law. No. For ye have robbed me, even this whole nation. Verse 10. It says, bring ye how many? All the tithes into my storehouse. In another series, we'll have the time to discuss what storehouse is because there are three platforms that qualify to be called a storehouse. In fact, I think I should just say it in one minute. Number one, a storehouse means your place of primary spiritual nourishment. It qualifies, it is the first biblical platform that is called a storehouse. Your place of primary spiritual nourishment. Number two, a storehouse also refers to any ministry that is committed to the salvation of souls and the transformation of lives. These two things must be there. If it is not actively committed to the salvation of souls and the equipping of the saints, it does not qualify to be called a storehouse. It's an uncomfortable truth, but this is the truth. And then number three, the storehouse can also by extension refer to an individual, a minister who is committed to the salvation of souls and the equipping of the saints. There are conditions where an individual can be regarded as a storehouse. These are the three. Just take it like this for now. In another series, as God grants us grace, we'll open deeper into this. I just didn't want to leave that gray area. But it says, bring ye all the tithes into my storehouse, that there may be meat in my house, and prove me now, here which said the Lord. There are seven prophetic blessings according to scripture here that follow the title. Number one, God will open for you the windows of heaven. Number two, you will, you will pour out a blessing that you will not have room enough for it. Fathers like Kenneth Copeland will call it concept, insights, and ideas. Next verse, it says, I will rebuke the devourer. The third, the devourer is a waster that comes to bring all kinds of waste on legal basis to your life. 
Number four, he says he shall not destroy the fruit of your ground. Your ground is anywhere you plant. Can be your business, can be your life. And then number five, he said, neither shall your vine cast its young before its time. Number six, he says you shall be called, you shall be a delightsome land. Please go to, um, all nations shall call you blessed, verse 12. And ye shall be a delightsome land. Seven prophetic blessings according to scripture. When Jesus was rebuking the scribes and Pharisees for their being hypocritical, he did not negate the subject of tithing. He said, you tithe and you do all of these things and you negate the weightier matter. So Jesus identified this as part of the things that the believers should know. Tithe is very important. Number three. So number one is the law of absolute surrender. Number two is the law of the tithe. And then number three is called the law of giving you can put in bracket the law of seed time and harvest these are the three spiritual laws principally now under the law of seed time and harvest there are so many i don't want to run into it this night but then it's sufficient for you to know that the law of giving the law of seed time and harvest is a foundational spiritual law are we together now very important Luke chapter 6 and verse 38, we read it earlier. Here's what it says. It says, give and it shall be given unto you. So the Bible states clearly here that when you give, it shall be given unto you. Genesis chapter 8 and verse 22, we're rushing for time. This was Noah after the flood and a proclamation came from heaven on account of the sacrifice that he read. It says, while the earth remaineth, seed time and harvest cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night shall not cease. This is an ordinance that will last while the earth remains. That means anytime you don't find the earth, stop obeying the law. But provided you can see the earth, you should know the law is in force. What is seed time and harvest? It means that the economic system of the kingdom runs on the principle of seed time and have a spiritually speaking that anything you do not have it is because you did not plant the seed for it and seed here does not mean money if you want a harvest of kindness sow the seed of kindness if you want there are seeds and their corresponding harvests honor listen carefully honor is the seed for a harvest called access good understanding is the seed for a harvest called favor diligence listen carefully is the seed for what we call lifting. So it is about understanding seeds and harvest. A question is the seed for an answer. Knowledge and wisdom are the keys for enlightenment. Are we together now? Yes. There are different kinds of giving. The Bible now switches to let us know that giving and receiving is sowing and reaping that in this kingdom every time you give you are a farmer who is sowing second corinthians chapter 9 we'll start from verse 6 so we've identified the fact that the bible talks about giving and receiving it says but this i say he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully go ahead seven it says every man here is the condition and this is the cure for manipulation and control in the church every man according as he has purpose in his heart so let him give not grudgingly nor of necessity for god loves a cheerful giver verse eight and god by reason of your sowing have you seen that he's talking about sowing and reaping now he turns to giving and receiving so in the kingdom one of the ways that we sow is by giving. One of the ways that we reap is by receiving. He says, God is able to make all grace abound towards you so that you always having all sufficiency in all things may abound unto every good work. Can I be honest with you? Ask anybody who God has lifted in the kingdom. If you do not engage the law of giving and receiving, there is a limit in fact, you may not be able to rise to certain realms. Now, there are different kinds of givings with different levels of harvest allocated to them. 
Let me just run down. I may not have the time to explain them. Our time is already spent. Forgive me. We have what we call the worship offering. According to Deuteronomy 16, 16, the Bible says to not come before him empty. I'm trying to run very quickly. So there is what we call the worship offering. That when you come before God, it is not a compulsion. It's out of revelation that you should not come to the house of God empty. Based on revelation as proof of your love for him. So there is the worship offering. Number two, there is what we call kingdom investments. This is one of the major giving platforms that fulfills the spiritual law of wealth and abundance. Haggai chapter 1, I believe. Am I right on that? Yes. When you read from verse 2 and 3, Haggai, the prophet was speaking, chapter 1 from verse 2 and 3. He says, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, These people say, The time is not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. Verse 3. He says, Am I right on that? Verse 3. Then came the word of the Lord by Haggai, the prophet, saying, Aha, uh -huh, next verse, let's see. Is it time for you, O ye, to dwell in your sealed houses and this house lie waste? Kingdom investment. Therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. It says, ye have sown much and bring in little. This is the result. Ye eat but have not enough. Ye drink but are not filled with drink. Ye clothe you but there is none warm. And he that earned wages, only earned wages to put it into a bag that has holes. What is the message here? That your, your participation in the Lord's work, you shouldn't wait until there is a call. By the way, there is absolutely nothing wrong in calling people to give, provided the needs are clear, the revelation is there, and it is done within the boundary of integrity. The key word always is integrity. Are we together? There is nothing wrong with a man. I have gone to many places to preach and the people have come together and raised an offering to honor me and I have blessed them and prayed even in my secret place that God will bless them. There are times that the, the, the Lord, a church can agree together and put resources together and say, look, come and sow. We've done this as a ministry and I'm sure that we'll still do it as the days come. Soon we're going to be looking at our building project and God will grant us that grace. So there is nothing wrong. The key word is integrity and truth are we blessed kingdom investments there are others like seed faith connecting your seed and your your faith through a seed for a desired expectation is based on the principle of resurrection the bible says that every seed can die and that not only do you reap what you sow god is able to give your seed another body you can sow shame and reap joy you can use your seed to kill negative seasons in your life. I have taught this. The principle of seed faith is based on the principle of resurrection. The same way the old heaven and the old earth can pass away, you can use a seed and take a season that you don't like out of your life. You can tie it by faith. This is why it is dangerous to steal money in church. Because that money you see is only a tray. There are people putting courses on it, putting all kinds of yoke seasons that they want out of their life. When you steal money from church, you don't allow the seed to die. Ask Gehazi and Naaman. Just because leprosy left Naaman did not mean it went away. It was waiting and a man used a seed to bring it back to his life. I have used this as a principle. There are many people who have used the principle of seed faith. There are others like prophet offering. When I said it during the school of ministry, the students were laughing. Prophet's offering. Because that one has brought a lot of trouble. You know, we men of God, sometimes because we need money, we drum the issue of prophet offering. But the truth is that prophet offering is true. You can actually use a seed ethically. Uh, I, I wish I'm not the one who has to say this. But generally, according to scripture, you should not really go to meet a man empty-handed. It is scriptural, but it's just that those who have taught it, have taught it, with, they've robbed enough kinds of biases that makes it to look untrue. But it is true. As much as possible, it's a kingdom culture you should learn. Especially a man of God who has labored obviously in word and doctrine. As much as possible. This is not to make you uncomfortable in any way here, but I am telling you, I owe you to teach you the truth. I have never gone to meet any man of God. In fact, in principle... It is not my culture to meet people and not so into their lives. 
Then there is sowing to parents, both spiritual and physical, that attracts patriarchal blessings. These are different levels of giving. The Bible says, honor your father and your mother in the Lord, that your days may be long and that it shall be well with you. These are principles. There is the principle of first fruit that has largely been misunderstood in, in many circles, respectfully speaking. But I believe that principle is valid and again within the boundary of revelation and truth, that principle can be engaged. There are many others, sacrifice, vows. So all of these are there. But let me tell you, there are three that I know by revelation and by scripture that are directly related to the lifting of men. One is kingdom investments. Being act, an active participant in the work of the kingdom. Number two, prophet's offering. If done with revelation and understanding, you can sow into an anointing that will lift you in a way that will surprise you. God gave gifts to men and these gifts did not come empty. And then number three, seed faith, where you can tie an expectation to end seasons and open others. These three I have practiced in my life and have revealed to many who have practiced this ministry, has practiced this. Kingdom investments, prophets offering, and seed faith. 